Hi, uh, I'm Nicole Smeltikop, and I'm a librarian at Michigan State University Libraries. And I'm speaking today on behalf of my colleagues, Joshua Barton, Mike Erickson, Lucas Mack, and myself on our project to describe material from the 2019 Hong Kong protests. The Hong Kong protests started with a 2018 murder case in Taiwan committed by a Hong Kong resident who fled back to Hong Kong. Since Hong Kong and Taiwan have no extradition treaty and the existing mutual legal assistance agreement purposefully excludes mainland China, Macau, and Taiwan, the Hong Kong government sought to amend the extradition law to address the issue. Instead of limiting the scope to Taiwan, the government proposal also included mainland China and Macau. This caused concerns and skepticism among Hong Kong residents as they could open or as this could open a back door for the central government to extradite any dissidents back to the mainland for trial. On Sunday, June 9th, 2019, one million people took to the street to protest against the amendment. Contrary to people's expectation, the Hong Kong government announced the bill would have its second reading in the Legislative Council as scheduled. This sparked public outcry and people staged demonstrations near the Legislative Council complex for the next two days. On Wednesday morning, the day when the Legislative Council was scheduled to meet, people located the surrounding area of the complex trying to stop the meeting from happening. Police later declared the demonstration a riot and deployed tear gas, and for the first time since the handover in 1997, rubber bullets were used to disperse the crowd. After witnessing the crackdown, two million people came out the following Sunday, and people started to demand for an investigation of excessive force by police, retraction of the riot classification, release of an amnesty for arrested protesters, universal suffrage for both the Legislative Council and the head of government, in addition to the withdrawal of the extradition bill, now known as the Five Demands. Initially, the government did not concede, and the clashes between police and protesters escalated throughout the summer. In September, the Hong Kong government finally withdrew the bill, but refused to concede on the other four demands. The protest movement continued. So uh, the project we're working on mostly revolved around zines. Um, and zine is short for a fanzine or magazine and is a DIY subculture self-publication, usually made on paper and reproduced with a photocopier or printer. Zine creators are often motivated by a desire to share knowledge or expertise with people in marginalized or otherwise less empowered communities. MSU Library Zine Collection is in our special collections and intersects with and supports collection strengths in popular culture and radicalism. In addition to extensive holdings and early punk fanzines from the UK and the US, we have many zines in varied areas of political activism and radicalism. This is why zines being issued in movements like the ongoing Hong Kong protests are in scope for us. They represent an opportunity to proactively forefront a marginalized voice and prevent historical erasure of marginalized perspectives. Collecting zines and materials by marginalized populations also relates to institutional values articulated in our strategic plan, including inclusivity and stewardship. The zines at the heart of this presentation were brought to Joshua Barton's attention, our MSU zine librarian, among other things, via a post on a UK-based zine librarian's listserv in September 2019. All of them were made or distributed by Zine Corp, a group with Hong Kong connections and were posted to an open Google Drive folder as PDFs. The materials included zines, posters, and other ephemera distributed in Hong Kong and elsewhere during the protests. In the message to the listserv, Zine Corp pa passed along a direct request to print, promote, and add the zines to library collections. So although it would mean working outside of the typical channels for acquisitions and collection building, we worked with in-house publishing services at the library to print and assemble the shared PDFs as conventional print zines. We worked with Lucas to help clear out any layout issues as he uh, is from Hong Kong and a native Chinese speaker. And we cataloged the zines, making some metadata decisions that we will go on to discuss. And even now, we are periodically checking for new material in the Zine Corp Google Drive folder. Library metadata needs to be consistent and predictable to improve search accuracy. 
A person may be known by various names and identity. Similarly, a concept may be called differently by laymen and professionals. It is the cataloger's job to bring all these variations together, making sure whatever variant form a patron uses, they will be redirected to the appropriate and authorized term used in the catalog. There are currently two programs in the U.S. that allow catalogers to establish relationships between authorized terms and its variants. NACO, the Name Authority Cooperative Program, is for names in the Library of Congress Name Authority file, while SACO, the Subject Authority Cooperative Program, is for terms in the Library of Congress subject headings. Catalogers contributing to these two national programs have to be trained to follow established cataloging policies and procedures. Submissions to SACO even have to be reviewed and approved by staff at the Library of Congress. So both of these processes are highly controlled. Creating new subject headings and names requires literary warrant, which means what a concept or name is called in a publication at the time of cataloging instead of what a concept should be called logically, even if nothing is published using that local logical terminology. This means that the new concept and name must be found in publications at the time material is cataloged in order to establish them as controlled metadata. Because the naming of a concept occurs after publications are received at a library, there is a delay, and sometimes a significant delay, between the realization of a need for a new concept or name and the ability to sign that controlled metadata in a library catalog record. Zines can defy publishing conventions in a myriad of ways. Basic info like author, title, and date might be hard to discern or missing altogether. These information gaps might send catalogers hunting for data to fill in the blanks, but the special nature of zines means those blanks might be intentional. Authors may be trying to fly under the radar to protect themselves. Catalogers, therefore, need to be mindful of the context zines are operating in and provide metadata or not accordingly. Additionally, since zines often emanate from marginalized communities or politically sensitive interests, subject cataloging with terms informed by literary warrant might use outdated or oppressive language, or there may not be any sufficient terms to describe the zine's content. The graphic materials we usually work with are mostly posters, but also some flyers and maps. Some of these are meant to advertise the creator, such as artistic prints or maps by a road commission, but many are meant as ephemera, things that are handed out or posted for a short time and then discarded. This makes the level of detail and information incredibly variable by piece. Either way, because these pieces are meant to be publicly consumed, graphic materials usually don't have the same confidentiality concerns as zines. In the MSU community, there are people of many backgrounds and varied perspectives. This includes staff member at the library from mainland China, as well as some from Hong Kong. Through this process, I learned of the very different perspectives on the Hong Kong protests based on where different people receive their news. Mainland China employees who received news from the official Chinese government expressed opinions that people were only being beaten by police if they were being rowdy. The story, this story came out of Western news outlets as police beating people at random on the subway. Because of this, Americans like myself without Chinese language expertise thought about the context of the need for help and then decided who to ask when I ran into language issues. If it was the standard Chinese translation, I asked anyone. However, one poster, uh, the one shown here, includes a Chinese character that was a new creation. This character intoned that police brutality was unjust. For this, I reached out to my colleague, Lucas, this was in part because he's sympathetic to the protests, but also because he has access to librarian communities who work with Chinese, Japanese, and Korean regularly to ask how to handle this situation. Cataloging zines in certain contexts can be a pipeline for zine metadata to reach networks on the semantic web. When zines represent radical new ideas, new ways of knowing, or revolutionary liberatory aims, the metadata related to those zines is laden with potential for both revolution and risk. There are ethical considerations to be made. Consider zine metadata on networks like WorldCat, the Library of Congress's linked data service, and local library bibliographic data being transformed into linked data. 
These are existing pipelines for library link data that are becoming more robust, with others also being developed as libraries slowly transition to link data models. The zine metadata could be disseminated and stored, cached across the internet. These are venues where the tensions of doing metadata work with zines play out because there is exciting revolutionary potential. But it also encodes and amplifies the vulnerability of zinesters themselves, perhaps permanently. The resulting linked data can be changed at its source, but it's not at all clear that it can be changed universally once it's disseminated and cached by third parties. Let's look at the upside of the tension first. One can think of network zine metadata as seeds of dissonance and change. It represents a potential recoding of dominant knowledge systems, a remapping of epistemologies by infiltrating the semantic web with new, more inclusive, revolutionary ways of knowing. Culture and metadata scholar Kate Eichhorn connects scene cataloging to Donna Haraway's feminist cyborg stories, recoding communication and intelligence to subvert command and control, making previously unimaginable identities that resist the prevailing binary code visible. In her work, The Archival Turn, a Turn to Feminism, Eichhorn sees zine cataloging as part of a larger epistemological project in which reinscription of zinesters' ways of knowing into machine readability may hold even greater potential for social change than the act of media transfer itself, such as digitization. It's pretty amazing. These seeds of change are also seeds of exposure. The flip side of zine metadata's potential latent visibility is an increased vulnerability, insofar as linked data remains uncertain in its capacity to be changed or recalled. Being part of this, oops, being part of the social change can mean adding Hong Kong-related terms and names to the established Library of Congress vocabularies. We were able to use primary source scenes and posters to establish literary warrant for Hong Kong, the Hong Kong protest, along with multiple variants for the protest. By using these collected primary source materials versus awaiting mainstream scholarly sources to be published and acquired, we've prepared the way for future cataloged mainstream scholarly publications to be linked with these primary sources, increasing their visibility. Additionally, the authority records where the names and subjects are publicly available and list the zines and poster where the metadata was found. In the case of named persons in the collection, we added these names to the Library of Congress name authority file. The example shown here is for Carrie Lam, current chief executive of Hong Kong. Because the protest material is what's being used as literary warrant, Carrie Lam's authority record will forever cite a flyer asking people to choose between her and a pile of poop. <laughs> Both of these previous examples, the zine and the poster, were anonymously created works, but imagine a scenario where a cataloger has sleuthed out the person or persons responsible for such works and added these names to the catalog record or used them as literary warrant for the Library of Congress's authority records. Those individuals would be permanently linked to these protest scenes and posters. It would be easy to see how this could lead to potentially disastrous consequences for the content creators in such a fraught situation as the Hong Kong protests. There are instances of cataloging librarians responding to concerns like these. The Zine Librarian Code of Ethics was produced in 2015 by participants in the Zine Librarians Unconference. It endeavors to address many of the concerns that go into working with zines in cultural heritage institutions and DIY libraries, including cataloging and metadata. An overriding theme, though, is the encouragement of deference to those to the interests of zine creators. Therefore, in the organization section of the code, readers are exhorted to weigh creator safety and privacy alongside more traditional concerns of discoverability of collections. How does this all add up to library metadata standing with Hong Kong? One of our intentions for this project was for it to be a good faith effort at leveraging our roles as cultural heritage workers to show solidarity with the protesters. We made a deliberate decision to work outside of conventional channels to make sure these materials were part of our collections. 
Particularly relevant to our values as librarians is the movement's desire to protect citizens' right to freedom from fear of extradition due to dissent. These zines are a direct expression of that desire. By following through on the zines creator's intent of adding these materials to our collection, creating in-person access to the material alongside the rest of our collections, and creating and disseminating metadata into the current and future data networks, we hope to proactively amplify the protesters' message and shape networks of knowledge accordingly. This is not a dispassionate, neutral stance, so we must acknowledge that there are other kinds of material that we haven't and won't be treating with the same level of attention. But this kind of emphasis on marginalized perspectives seems to us to be in line with our institution's strategic values around inclusivity and stewardship. Though we can be doing more and doing it better, or fronting this kind of social struggle an institution like ours is solidarity work. Thank you.